All right. Good evening. If you turn to your Bibles to Acts chapter 12, we are going to continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartarians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we could come again this evening, Lord, to give this day to you for the worship of the one who deserves to be worshipped, Lord. And we thank you because you are so good to us, Lord. I pray that you would make your word alive to us, Lord, that you would give us understanding through your Holy Spirit. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue, as I said, the study of the book of Acts, we see how the gospel continues to spread. And in the last couple of weeks, we saw how it continued to move through other nations. And, and many were being saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Antioch became the latest place where the Lord was working in a mighty way. And we saw how the Lord accomplished much there using his faithful servant, Barnabas. And there is so much that we could draw from the book of Acts. As I've been saying this, we see examples, as we talked about last week, of faithful men and women as they continue to reach people with the spread of the gospel. And we could see pictures of courageous and bold people. We see the church taking care of itself. And we see the Lord's incredible love and grace for sinners. However, the thing that stands above everything is the Lord does whatsoever he pleases and brings to pass everything according to his purpose. The Lord is in sovereign control of all things, bringing to pass everything. And in chapter 12, there is really no difference here. Now, some might look at the beginning of this chapter and say, well, the forces of evil seem to prevail here over the church and striking a blow to the Lord's anointed. For the first time, we are confronted with the murder of an apostle. In the New Testament, we read of three men named James. And we're learning here that the apostle James was murdered. And the three men that named James all were significant in the church. There was the apostle James, the son of Alphaeus, another apostle named James, who was the son of Zebedee and the brother of John. And then we have the James, who's the half-brother of our Lord, who was not an apostle, but came to faith after the Lord died and was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, who also authored the book of James. The James who we find was put to death here, again, is the apostle James, son of Zebedee and the brother of John. You know, there are four lists found throughout the New Testament that give us the whole panoply of the twelve apostles. And through Luke 6 and Acts 1 and Matthew 10 and Mark 3, we get this full list. And these people are, the apostles by name are Simon Peter, Cephas, James the son of Zebedee, John the brother of the above James, Andrew, Peter's brother, Philip, not Philip the evangelist or the one that was one of the seven, what some would call deacons, a different Philip. Then there was Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas 
Thaddeus, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who we all know is the betrayer, and then Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot. And then we learn in Acts 9 of the apostle who was born in due time, the apostle Paul. And, and here we see Herod killing James, the son of Zebedee. And he had him put to death with the sword. And that's likely a reference to a beheading. The only apostle whose death the Bible records is James. Interesting is in Matthew 20, James's mother had a request to make of Jesus. And in, in Matthew 20, starting in verse 20, it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What will thou? She, said, she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father." So Jesus gives not only uh, James and John and, his, and the mother a lesson of what it truly means to follow Christ, but there is this requirement, and that is a requirement to drink of this cup. And, and it's interesting here when we see what this cup is. You know, that's ever, do you ever ask yourself some questions like when you're reading through scripture and you're thinking, okay, well, they say they're able to drink of this cup. Do you ever say, am I able to drink of that cup? Am I able to drink of that cup of persecution for the name of Jesus Christ? And you know what? It's really easy for us to say yes as we sit here at this time in America where there's very little threat. But have you ever asked yourself, what Jesus asked James and John. Are you willing to be treated as a criminal when you are not? Are, are you able to have men say all manner of evil against you for the Lord's sake? Are you willing to be beaten, imprisoned, put to shame, be tortured and even murdered for the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, it's really a weighty question. And we should not come to that lightly and to say, yeah, of course. There should be some self-examination in that question. Since we live in a place and a time, like I said, that we're not under persecution for our faith, it seems convenient for us to answer yes. But of course, Jesus, I'm able to drink from that cup. However, if you really want to get a sense whether or not you're able to stand for Christ and suffer great persecution for your faith when it comes, maybe we should ask ourselves, am I standing for Christ now? Am I living unashamed of my faith? Do people know about my devotion and my love for Jesus Christ? Is that evident? Is my life consistent with what he commands us to do? Am I living according to the word of God? Am I picking up my cross daily and dying to myself and to the sin in my life? You know, this will give us a far better sense if we're able to drink of that cup than romanticizing about a time when persecution comes to America and then all of a sudden you're going to stand for Christ. Are you standing now? Now, not only James would die for Christ. In fact, if you consider the apostles of Christ and what become of them, became of them, you will see that it was not a life filled with honor or to be put up on a pedestal here on this earth. You know, it amazes me that these are apostates that fill the church today. And they call themselves apostles. And what are they looking for? They're looking for honor. You know, whether it be the Mormon church who claims to be the only true church because it has the apostolic secession who are a bunch of occultists really and don't even follow the words of Jesus. 
they're, they're, they blaspheme him with their actions. Or the new apostolic reformation who, who are a bunch of charlatans making money off of unwise sinful people who are always des also desiring money. And so they're willing to follow their heresy. But the real apostles of the Bible were men that gave their lives unconditionally for Jesus Christ. Since the Bible doesn't go into detail on the other apostles' death, we can look into some writings, traditional writings from the church during that time. And I just want to share a little bit with you some of what these writings are. Now take, keep in mind, this is not found in Scripture. These are supportive writings that have been at least made credible. Um, but it's not the inspired word of God, so we should not put it on that equal letter uh, level. So Peter, the most commonly accepted church tradition in regard to the death of Peter, was that he was crucified upside down in Rome and the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in John 21. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia and killed by a sword, probably beheaded too. John faced martyrdom when he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil during a wave of persecution in Rome. However, he was miraculously delivered from death. John was then sentenced to the mines on the prison island of Patmos where he wrote the, uh, the book of Revelation. The Apostle John was later freed and returned to what is now the modern day Turkey he died as an old man, the only apostle, as it is noted, that died peacefully. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, was a missionary to Asia. He, he witnessed in what is present-day Turkey and was martyred for his preaching and being whipped to death. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece after being whipped severely by seven soldiers, and tied his body to the cross with cords to prolong his agony. His followers reported that when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it in these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. He continued to preach to his tormentors for two days until he died. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips to establish the church there. Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace the traitor Judas, was stoned and then beheaded. Paul was tortured, then beheaded by the evil emperor Nero in Rome in AD 67. And James, even though not an apostle, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was thrown from the southwest pinnacle of the temple when he refused to deny his faith in Christ, when he, they discovered that he survived the fall, his enemies beat James to death with a club. Now these are traditions regarding other apostles as well, but none of them are as reliable. But here's the point. It's not so important how the apostles died. It's what is important is the fact that they were all willing to die for their faith. And if you really think about it, and I know this has been talked about before, but if Jesus had not been resurrected and the apostles were not witnesses of that, would they go throughout the world and would they die for their faith for a lie? Most likely they would not. It's, it's, it's a tremendous evidence that that what Jesus did in the lives of the people and then coming, then dying for our sins and being resurrected, these apostles were witnesses of it and they took it serious, what he instructed them to do, to go out into the nations. And did you notice when they went forth and they died in these different places, what were they doing? They were going forward. They were still acting on the Great Commission. Personally, I can't stand it when people say witnessing is not a big deal for the church today. Some churches don't even give their members opportunities to go out. They don't even emphasize the importance of it. That was the primary focus of the church, and it is today. It absolutely is. It is the primary function of the church is to be faithful to the Great Commission. Those who don't think it's important, you know, many righteous men died doing it. And, and 
They rather face death than be disobedient to our Lord's command to go. In fact, a church that does not encourage its people to share the gospel is not a faithful church. I could say that with a clear conscience. You know, we, we have to check ourselves too, right? I know there's opportunities in this church and it's preached from this pulpit that we must continue to go on with the gospel. But we've got to be careful that we don't lose sight of the fact that that's what is primary. And if it is primary, then it's the very thing that we are praying about each and every day. Praying for opportunities that the Lord would lead us in to go reach people. And, and if you feel like you've lost that zeal and you've become apathetic, you know, Jesus gives the church of the Laodiceans a harsh rebuke in Revelation 3. And we need to take heed. He says in Revelation 3, verses 15 16, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would not work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew, spew thee out of my mouth. We, <laughs> we got to pay attention. And believe me, you know, I, I'm not trying to guilt anyone into being faithful to the Great Commission. That would be ridiculous. That's not my purpose. My purpose is just to give you the truth that's found in God's Word and have you seek the Lord in this. I would encourage you to pray and seek Him. Now, going back to Acts 12, the first four verses, we find that James is dead. Peter has been taken into custody and is scheduled to be executed after the Easter celebration by the wicked king Herod Agrippa I. He was the grandson of Herod the Great who slaughtered the infants of Bethlehem and the nephew of Herod Antipas, the, the tetrarch who killed John the Baptist. And Herod acted out of a desire to please the Jews who were opposing the Christians. And so now, as it saw, that he saw that it pleased them, that he put to death James, he now arrests Peter, and for no reason but to gain popularity and, and, and for political gain. And there are times when evil seems to be winning the day. Wicked men seem to, to get away with murder, and their popularity goes up. The righteous suffer terribly. It's easy at such times to wonder, where is God in all of this? Why did he allow this to happen? How can any good come out of such an awful wickedness? You know, the psalmist Asaph asked the same question in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, it says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they, they say, how doth God know and is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches." And here with the psalmist, we could sometimes be short-sighted ourselves and wonder, is God truly in control? Is He truly sovereign? What is going on? Why are the wicked prospering? But we would be good to seek the counsel of the psalmist when he spends time with the Lord in His Word. Then he understands that God is the judge of all the earth and will do right. He will judge the wicked. Sometimes in this world, but all the time in the next, 
to come in all of eternity. And the psalmist, a few verses, tells us in, in, in verse 17, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly, utterly consumed with terrors. So we should never be filled with that. The Lord is in control of everything and working all things to his perfect will. You know, when terrible times hit us and we doubt and ask, where is God in all of this? It really exposes two things. The first thing, a lack of faith. Honestly, it's a lack of faith. There's no other way to put it. And secondly, stupidity. I'll tell you what I mean. And to be brutally honest, when we wonder where is God, we are acting, as Scripture would say, like a stupid animal. Listen to the psalmist. Listen in verse 21 of the same psalm, Psalm 73. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. A stupid animal with no knowledge. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. You know, when we ask, where is God in this calamity? We are really saying, God, do you really know what you're doing? We need to recognize at that point that we are the ones that have no clue. Not God, we are the ones and that we are in deep sin. We are the ignorant ones and we must repent. And we need to go to God in prayer and repent and trust his counsel. And no matter what happens to us in this life, whether it be persecution or illness unto death, we must be reminded that afterward he will receive us unto glory. We must live with that eternal perspective. You know, you think about what's going on in our in the world today with the coronavirus. I want to say something. The coronavirus could not exist if it was not part of God's perfect plan. Did you hear me? It, it, it could not exist if it was not part of God's perfect plan. And as Christians, we need to trust the Lord that he is working that perfect plan through all of this. I really think one of the worst witnesses we could have for the Lord is when we doubt God and we act like we have no hope like the rest of the world. In verse 3 of our text, it tells us, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. The Jews were along the line of a bloodthirsty generation of men who had killed the prophets and the Lord Jesus and who are now greedy after the death of the apostles. And we can easily see from what principle Herod acted. It was not out of regard to the Jewish religion, rites, or ceremonies, but to make himself into the affections of the people. And since the murder of James pleased them, he now turned to Peter. You know, it's interesting here, because the Bible also tells us that then were the days of unleavened bread. The days of unleavened bread came after Passover. And Acts 12.3 tells us that Peter was apprehended during the days of unleavened bread. This means that the day of Passover had already occurred. Easter could not have been Passover because Passover occurs before the days of unleavened bread. Pass Passover had come and gone. And Herod decided to bring Peter forth after Easter. Now, just think about this proper sequence here as it's presented in the text. You have Passover, then you have the days of unleavened bread, and then we have the only mention of Easter in Scripture after that. Now, Herod arrested Peter during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So here is the controversy. And I'll just, I just want to briefly touch on this because I think it's important. It's the only time that you will find the word Easter in the King James Version, right? And, and so here is the controversy about 
about the King James Version. Some will say that the translator of the King James Version incorrectly translated the word Pascha, which is translated Passover everywhere else in the Bible, including the King James Version, but here. And the school of thought here is that at the time, the influence of the Catholic Church, which melded the pagan holiday of Ishtar with the death and resurrection of Jesus, was the source of the translator using the word Easter. Others would say that, no, the King James Bible translates this word correctly and doesn't use Passover as many modern English versions do. Easter is correct, because, and Easter is a pagan holiday, and the Bible doesn't deny that. The Bible is simply teaching that Peter was taken by Herod during the days of unleavened bread, and Herod was planning to kill Peter after Easter. No doubt Herod was probably busy engaging and celebrating in this pagan holiday himself. And honestly, I don't know which one to believe, okay? And, and maybe you should study it too. But however, here's the important thing. Either way, the takeaway here is that the Bible is not endorsing the celebration of Easter. I just want to be clear about that. There is a difference between Easter celebration or of the celebration of that false fertility god, Ishtar, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Jesus was crucified as our Passover lamb. The Jewish Passover was always a foreshadow of the ultimate Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus rose three days later. This is why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, three days after the Jewish Passover, and never on Easter. You know, sometimes our calendar, it lands on the same day. But just so you know the root of this, Catholicism melded the pagan idolatrous celebration with Jesus' resurrection, which if you think about it, that is totally blasphemous. We're called to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we should never be afraid of the truth. It is the very thing that sets us free. The founders of this country, the Puritans, knew that Easter was idolatrous and, and that a, a, a celebration not to be celebrated by any Christians. And it was disallowed for up to 150 years ago. No one ever celebrated it. And it's kind of amazing when you think about it. And honestly, Easter, Christmas, Halloween are all pagan celebrations. Never, ever ordained by God, but the invention of pagans in the blasphemous Catholic Church. You know, some might say, well, you know, Halloween is satanic, no doubt, but the other two are not. If you would ever take the time to study the origins of the other holidays, you'll find out that they're just as satanic as Halloween. And you might say, well, Christian, you know, they could celebrate. What's so wrong about, you know, Christmas presents and wreaths and mistletoes and trees, Easter chocolate bunnies and eggs are all harmless. I'm not doing anything wrong. Okay, tell me what did God mean when he said through his prophet Jeremiah, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. You have to answer that question yourself. Or what did he mean when he wrote through the Apostle Paul, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? See, this is the Catholic Church melding uh, melding righteousness with unrighteousness, melding light with darkness. You know, we look at that passage there in 2 Corinthians 6, sorry, in verse 14. I, want to do, I do want to read the rest so you get a better understanding. But we look at this and we say, well, this only has to do with not marrying an unbeliever or maybe not you know, entering into a business deal with an unbeliever, which that's all true too. But it's really more than that. Listen, verses 15. And what concord with Christ, what hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath, listen to this, the temple of God with idols? For ye are not the temple of, 
For are ye not the temple of the living God? As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It's very clear, scripture is clear, that we are not to do the practices of the heathen. If we know that those holidays have their origins in paganism, and then they were made so, so supposedly Christianized by the Catholic Church, why would we ever follow those? No, but people will say, my family loves these celebrations, and I don't want to disappoint them. Okay. I just want to ask you this and we'll leave it alone. Do you feel comfortable taking that line of reason to Jesus Christ? Do you feel in good conscience you could tell Christ that? Well, my family really likes it. Therefore, I think we just really need to be witnesses, especially at this time. If, if, if we go out with chocolate Easter bunnies and eggs and do all those things that are based as symbols of pagan rituals. What are we doing for the cause of Christ? See, our number one goal is what? The Great Commission is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not to meld with the pagan practices. And here in verse 4 of our text, it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Herod was ins ensuring that Peter would be there for the show, that he could, right after the Easter celebration, that he could have Peter and kill him before the crowd. So Herod put 16 soldiers assigned to guard Peter that day and night. During that night, Peter has two soldiers bound to him by chains. He's, he's taking no chances of his escape. And I'm sure it was well known through Jerusalem how Peter, along with John, was once before imprisoned and guarded and how they escaped, or at least they thought that he, they escaped. And it says, as we read before in Acts 5, Verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. What we find is not that they escaped by their own ingenuity, but by a miraculous work of God. However, the pagan king Herod probably only believed they escaped the first time because of the guards' incompetency, and, and it looks like he's ensuring that this one happened again. And then in verse 5 it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What should we always do? What should our first response always be when our brothers and sisters are in danger? Prayer. Prayer. So what's at stake here? If Peter is to die, what would that mean for the church? Would it come to an end? No, of course not, right? Because it wasn't Peter's church. It was the Lord Jesus Christ's church. He is the cornerstone, right? And here we see that the prayer of the saints for Peter was without ceasing. Never, ever underestimate the power of prayer. I believe sometimes we pray and we're not sure if what we pray for will come to pass. Or sometimes we think that our prayers are weak. They're not strong enough. And we believe if our prayers were just stronger, then maybe things would work out. Or, or sometimes people pray, and when, and when they do not see the required results or the desired results from their prayers, they get discouraged, they lose hope, maybe even their faith, and they stop praying. I, I, there's, 
a few times that I, we were out on uh, witnessing, talking to a person and said, oh, I used to believe in God, but this happened in my house, in my life, and I prayed and I prayed and God didn't answer. And so I figured I'm walking away from God. Well, we know that they were never truly Christians at that point. But for some people, they get extremely discouraged. In all these examples, there is a huge problem. And, and, and this is the problem. The power of prayer is not the result of the person praying. Here's what I mean by that. Rather, the power resides with God. Not the power of the person praying. It resides with God. There is power in prayer, not because of us. It's because God is all powerful. Because God is able to do anything. He is omnipotent. To underestimate the power of prayer is to underestimate God's power. And the scripture tells us in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is Thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. Psalm 28, 7 tells us the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song will I praise him. I love Ephesians 1 verses 19 through 21. It says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and sat him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Let me give you one more here. Psalm eighty-nine, thirteen: 13. Thou has a mighty arm. Strong is thy hand and high is thy right hand. You see, the power is with God, not with us. Our faith is never placed in us or our power, but our, but our strength is in Him, just as our faith is in Him. So the key to an effectual prayer is God's power in knowing His will. Now many will say, okay, what about James? Let's go to James because James tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The key here is that this not only is a, a prayer, a passionate and intense prayer, but it is from someone who is righteous and is living according to God's will. In fact, if you read the whole verse in context, you will find that these prayers are effectual because they are made by one Listen, who has a humble heart and someone who is repenting of their sins. Let's read the whole verse in context. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And again, this is not because living this way, you now have more power than someone who is not. Remember, the power of answered prayer is always with God. It just means that you are praying for the right things and you are in tune with God's very will. Listen to why Paul's prayers were effective. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, it may be... it." By any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. The key to praying is praying according to God's will. Living according to his will. Paul will say this in Romans 8, verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth that is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? According to the will of God. 
Paul even relies on the Holy Spirit to pray according to God's will. Not demanding what we want, but seeking God and His will in prayer. You know, when Jesus was giving us a blueprint on how we should pray, He told us that we should pray that God's will be done. In Matthew 6, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus also told us that we can, can ask anything of God and he will answer our prayer with a couple of important factors, right? That it would be from someone who is a living according to God's will and that aligns with his words, Jesus' words. Listen to what John 15 says, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Think about this. Jesus is saying, look, it's not about you at all. I chose you. I ordained you. I gave you the faith. It's my Holy Spirit that bears fruit through you. And gives you the understanding of my will so that when you pray, you're praying in my name. Many times people rebel against God's spirit and not bearing his fruit. They're not living humble and repenting lives. And therefore, they don't even know the will of God. In fact, they are living for the world and the desires of it, not the will of God. They might go to church, but their hearts are set upon other things and not God. They are set upon their own will and what they want in life. They pray for all kinds of things and then just add in Jesus' name at the end of it like it's the magic words that are supposed to seal that prayer and God's got to honor it now. You know what that is? That's pagan superstition. That's not praying according to the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It's just like I put these words at the end and there it goes. You better honor it now. When we pray in Jesus' names, it's our prayer is in accordance to his word, to everything he stood for. The book of James describes these people. James 4, verse 3, it says, Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace wherefore he saith God resisteth the proud. Here it is. But giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what? He shall lift you up. That's an amazing passage here. James is actually addressing this whole issue here. These people pray, but God doesn't answer. <coughs> they pray amiss. They don't pray according to the will of God. They pray according to the will of themselves and their lusts. And they are worldly minded. And what else? They are proud and not humble. They're not asking God to search themselves and root out all manner of unrighteousness. Like, like David did in Psalm 139, who said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. <coughs> this is the prayer of a righteous man, not the prayer of a proud, arrogant man demanding of God. This is the prayer of a righteous man, not a morally sinless man. So, we have to ask ourselves, where are we? Do you want God's power in your prayer? Are you humble? Are you subjected to his will, not your lust? 
Are you repenting of your sins and asking God to show you so that you could turn from it? Do you know God's will? Are you reading the word to find it out so that you could pray according to it? Are you living, endeavoring to live for Jesus? If we are, we can have great faith and confidence that God's power will be in our prayers. That's what Jesus was getting at in John 15. John writes in 1 John 5, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Because it's a prayer, knowing God, knowing his will, being in communion with him. The saints who were gathered together praying for Peter were people who were living for God and desired the will of God. They were humble and they were seeking him. Because truth be told... God will not change his mind for you if you are not praying for something in accordance to his will. We just, it's the truth. It's all through scripture. We need to understand that. The other thing that I think is amazing is Peter's attitude. He's in prison. He's on death row. He, he might even know that his life is going to end tomorrow, that he'll be executed. Now, think about this. Put yourself in Peter's place, right? W would you be up all night fretting about what's going to happen to you tomorrow? Would you be filled with anxiety? But how do we find Peter? I love this. Yeah. In, in verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Peter's sleeping, not only sleeping, but deeply sleeping, like good sleep, right? Why do we know that? Because when the angel entered in, right, and the light shone about him, what? He had to he hit him on the side, say, hey, let's go, huh? I can just imagine. I don't know. To me, this is so convicting, right? Here we have Peter who is living a life surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's facing execution the next day and he is so trusting of the Lord that he has peace, that he could sleep. Think about all the things that keep you up at night. For Peter, it didn't matter what might come of his life. He was trusting that God would, would do whatever his will was for him. Whether that would be to free him from this affliction or that he might be my, martyred and die for Christ. Either way, he knew that the Lord would work his perfect plan. Why? Because he knew that the Lord loves him and that the Lord is in control and whatever he had to go through was for his glory. I want to live that way. I want to live with that kind of trust and faith in the Lord. Have you ever considered when praying for something, you pray, Lord, here's my heart, and that's okay, we give the heart, our heart to the Lord. We should know his will, though. And, but do you ever consider praying and saying, Lord, I desi I'm desirous of this, but whatever your will is, bring that to pass. Or, Lord, I am praying for healing or relief, but whatever will bring you more glory, you do. Sometimes God gets more glory in his martyrs. Sometimes God gets more glory in people who have to walk through this life with affliction because it proves that God's grace is sufficient. To have that kind of confidence, you must live a life of complete surrender to the Lord. Because if you don't, you will never have that kind of hope and you will never have that kind of peace and you will never have that kind of confidence. Peter would go on and write this in 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, 
who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And he goes on to say, Wherefore ye greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Why is our faith found that way? Because it was a faith that was given by God. He's the author and the finisher of earth finisher of that faith and he will continue to grow that faith and it is for his glory just know that that the faith that God has given you is not just so that you could have more confidence in this world the faith that you should be wanting to God to continue to nourish and grow through his Holy Spirit and the reading of the word and walking in obedience is something that's put inside of you for God's glory it's for his glory. Your faith is for his glory. How marvelous. Amazing to see how Peter and the others in the book of Acts live their lives with complete trust in the Lord, even in the midst of severe persecution. You know what? That should challenge us all. It truly should. We have the same Holy Spirit living in us. We have a faith that's been given by the Lord Jesus Christ to us as a gift. There is really no reason that we should walk around in panic and fear all the time. There's no reason. In fact, I'll tell you this, it's sinful. It is sinful. And it comes down to self-examining ourselves. Do I truly trust the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it really challenges us, Lord. I'm thankful that you are a mighty, powerful God that does your will all the time, that you're in control. I'm not in control. Lord, you, you even give me the words to pray to you, Lord, according to your will. It's amazing to see, Lord, how you operate in your bride, a bride that you are are, are cleansing and making beautiful for yourself. I thank you, Lord, that we could be a part of that. Lord, I do pray that we would never forget what is primary. As these apostles did, as disciples after them, as men of God and women of God after them died for their faith by just going out and being faithful to your command of the Great Commission, let us also, Lord, not come to a place of apathy where we don't think it's that important or we know it's important, but it's no big deal. Let us never think that, Lord. You are so good. You are so merciful and you're so patient with us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to grow us, that you would continue to grow this church, that we would have a desire, that we would have a passion to be faithful, to be a witness for your glory. Lord, I pray that you do a mighty work in this church. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.